Galatians chapter 6, our study tonight is the first 10 verses. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Please highlight that sentence. Nowhere in your Bible does it say you should test somebody else's actions. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself. And of course, that's a godly pride. Without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in well-doing, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of God. Father, that's one of the great things about Friday nights. We could be out doing a lot of things, but we have chosen We've chosen the privilege of hanging out with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Teach us tonight, Lord, how to keep in step with the Spirit, or the way we like to say it here at Calvary Chapel, how to just be with Jesus. What does it look like? I pray, Father, if there's anyone here in this group who isn't yet born again, I pray that this would be the night that you would knock on the door of their hearts and they would respond today. Your Bible says, Lord, is the day of salvation. Do not harden your hearts. The time is short. I also pray for those of us in the family of God, Lord, who have come here tonight with burdens that we're carrying. Tonight, Lord, give us big shoulders, your shoulders, so that we can bear one another's burdens. And as we close tonight in time of prayer, Lord, it's my prayer that we would see those burdens come flying off people. And then we could keep in step with the Spirit. We love you, Lord, and we're grateful for all that you've done and continue to do. Bless our time together. We pray these things by faith in the name above all names. Indeed, how great thou art. Amen. Keeping in step with the Spirit. Now, remember, there's no chapter and verse divisions that are inspired by God. They were created by men. And so this just carries on as Paul closing the book of Galatians. It just carries on from our last study. And that's when we're told to keep in step with the Spirit. And again, I repeat, even though I said it in the prayer, that it just means to just be with Jesus. And sometimes we want to know what that looks like. What do you mean? And I have that all the time. Because Pastor Ron, what do you mean just be with Jesus? Well, Jesus himself said, my sheep know my voice. I call them by name and they follow me. And people sometimes say, well, it's really hard being a Christian. And I tell you all the time, it's much harder not being. All we have to do is follow Jesus. Now, I don't know if this will work for you, but it's always worked for me. In my mind, I have a picture of me following Jesus. I'm not trying to get around him. I'm not trying to get, walk next to him. I'm not trying to get ahead of him for any reason. I'm just following him, but I'm following him so closely. When he picks his foot up off one place, my foot is going in that, that spot, that footprint that he left. And I want to stay so close to him that if he ever decides to stop suddenly without warning, I'm just going to smash into him. Because that's what it means to keep in step with the Spirit. Think about Jesus when he was here. He kept in step with his Father by keeping in step with the Spirit. 
Jesus faced every trial as a human being. He veiled his deity. He didn't just pull a miracle here and a miracle there to make his life easier. Everything he did and everything he said was led directly by the Spirit of God. I only do what I see my Father do, and I only say what I hear my Father say. Though we're not Jesus, though we have this ugly sin nature that we have to contend with, it really is that simple for each and every one of us. We can just walk with Jesus every single day and life gets rich. In our study tonight, Paul begins to tell us how to do that. He begins with verse 1, brothers. If someone is caught in a sin, now this isn't a willful sin, this isn't a lifestyle of sin, this is somebody who wants to do the right thing, but, but finds himself not doing the right thing. And he or she hates the fact that they didn't do it, but they're feeling really guilty. The enemy is condemning them. And he says, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. Now, if you can do that, write your name in the margin of the Bible by verse 1. Because we're the mature Christians, and that's the idea here. You who are spiritual, you who are spiritually mature, we should be the ones who are helping people get back together with Jesus to get right with God. Now, the word translated gently here is a wonderful word picture because it's like setting a broken bone. Now, you know when somebody breaks a bone, it hurts. There's pain. And you wouldn't just go, oh, come on, shake it off. You go over there and you gently help them, try to ease their pain and comfort them and give them some hope and encouragement. Well, when someone is caught in a sin, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to point a finger and say, well, you know, I knew you weren't serving God. I knew something was wrong in your life. We don't do those kind of things. We don't even say, what were you thinking? When someone wants to get right with God, it's our responsibility to lead that man or that woman to the place where they can understand the goodness and the forgiveness of God. Now, you remember we finished last time talking about the fruits of the Spirit. And that's why this chapter is important, because these are the fruits of the Spirit in action. We also remember from that study last time that love is the singular fruit of the Spirit, and then all of those other good things, like gentleness, flows from that fruit of the Spirit that is love. And so when someone is caught in a sin, it's our responsibility to love them to health, to give them an idea how they can get back to Jesus and get right with God. When we walk in love, when we walk in the Spirit, restoration is always the goal, always the goal. And Paul is telling us that if you're going to walk with Jesus in, the, in step with the Spirit, then and only then we have to restore people gently. And that demonstrates that we are, in fact, walking in the Spirit instead of in the flesh. You know, one of the things that's troubling for me is that so often we who are Christians, when somebody else is sinning and things aren't going well, we kind of think, well, they deserve that. We want justice for them. But we get caught in a sin and say, oh, have mercy on me, oh Lord. We, we need to be very honest. Our job is reconciliation. It is the ministry that God has given us. It's the ministry that Jesus himself had. He reconciled you and me while we were yet sinners. God died for the ungodly. Well, the same thing is true for us. We need to be men and women who are gentle, giving hope and encouragement to people who have messed up. One sign that we are mature spiritually is our eagerness, actually, to restore in gentleness, again, the fruit of the Spirit. And then he says this, but watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. One of the problems that we have, looking at the book of Galatians, we've been talking about legalism and all of that, but Paul has shifted gears here, and now he's getting very specific to our own walks with the Lord. We need to watch ourselves. In other words, if we're not being gentle, if we're being harsh, if we're being judgmental, then that sets us up for the enemy to come and pound us. 
So watch yourselves. We need to be humble. We need to be men and women who understand that people blow it just like we know that sometimes we blow it and we've got to be available to God to be used to help restore people in sin. If you're truly a spiritual believer, a mature Christian, that ministry of reconciliation has been given to all of us. It is, as I said, the same ministry Jesus had. Someone's caught in a sin, we need to tell them. We need to tell them in love. They've broken God's heart. But we also need to be telling them about God's compassion and his patience and the fact that he's slow to anger and that all we have to do as born-again Christians, all we have to do is come back and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Now, that's what we want to hear. But God is telling us now, if we're going to walk in step with the Spirit, these are the kind of instruments that we've got to be. We need to tell them God loves them still, and God is eager to reconnect with them, and he makes it easy, and then walk beside them to get to that place where they can be reconciled to God. It's also true that we have to be equally quick to restore them to fellowship once they are repentant. Now, if they're not repentant, there's nothing we can do. We can tell them about God's love. We can tell them about God's patience. We can say, look, God's not surprised by this. He's not angry at you. He's not frustrated with you. But his heart is broken. And we've got to love people enough to tell them that if they're unwilling to repent, things are going to get worse. And you say, well, how is that gentle? Well, that's pretty gentle when you compare it to the Apostle Paul. He's a man who practiced what he preached. You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he dealt with a sin that was very well known in the church at Corinth. In fact, people were sort of snickering behind the scenes about it. Did you see this? A man was having sex with his mother-in-law. And it was just one of those things where everybody knew about it. Now, I don't know whether this guy was a huge giver or what, but nobody in Corinth in the church was doing anything about it. And Paul scolded them. He said, this is going on in your very eyes and you've done nothing about it. And then he said this, you want to hear harsh? I've already handed that man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Put him out and leave him alone to deal with the consequences of his sin. Now, Paul's goal, of course, was restoration. He said, I've handed him over for the destruction of his flesh. Here's the key, so that his soul might be saved on that day. And the church had a decision to make. Are we going to be faithful in disciplining this man as we were instructed to by Paul? Or are we going to keep just turning a blind eye to the sin? And that's never loving. Well, what happens here is Paul judges him, puts him out, and then waits to see what the Corinthians will do. Now, our question is, did it work? Well, six months or so later, when Paul wrote the second letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 2, Paul says, look, the punishment inflicted on such a man, it's enough. In other words, he's sorry, he's repented. Open your arms wide and welcome him back and receive him. Now, he doesn't tell him when he comes back, you know, gossip about him or whisper behind his back. No, welcome him back. He suffered enough, and, and Paul is concerned that if they don't reach out to him as a body, then guilt and condemnation are going to overwhelm him. And Paul said, we can't let that happen. Church discipline really works if you do it God's way and if you do it with God's heart. It's hard in our church culture. We just have way too many churches. The churches get too big. If somebody is in sin here and we say, look, you can't keep coming to church if you're going to live an unrepentant life all the while proclaiming to be a Christian, well, they just go to another church and start all over again. Even in our church, there have been times when we've had to execute discipline on someone. And there were people, even in our body, <clears throat> excuse me, people who know me and know my heart. I say, well, Pastor Ron's being too hard on him. No, what we want is for them to get right. That's part of the reconciliation process. We have to deal with them gently, but we also have to deal with them firmly, especially in the case where they're being unrepentant. 
Here's more good fruit. If you're keeping in step with the Spirit, verse 2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, strength, and soul. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, that doesn't mean you've got to learn to love yourself. That means love your neighbor before yourself. And I told you many, many times, all of us, we already know how to love ourselves. We're crazy about ourselves. But the idea is we bear one another's burdens. And in so doing, then we're just walking right in step with Jesus. We need to care about people. Now, this is family business here. We care about what people are going through. We care about the pain in their lives. We care about the the, the overwhelming difficulties some people are having. And we come alongside them. We don't just ignore them. We don't just hang around with the same people we always hang around with. We offer to carry one another's burdens. Now, in a few moments, we're going to be told to carry our own burdens. we got to do that, too. But any of you who have really struggled with some things, isn't it really nice when somebody comes along and offers you some help? Well, that's exactly what he's saying. Carry each other's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. We remember that Jesus said that the Pharisees laid burdens on others that they themselves could not keep. I think a lot of us do that. We see somebody who's going through something, and like Job's friends, we assume that they must be at fault or something's wrong in their walk with God. That is not at all carrying somebody else's burdens. Remember, it was the Pharisees who trapped the woman caught in the act of adultery. Isn't it interesting how they caught the woman caught in the act of adultery and let the man escape their trap? And they were accusing her of something that would be punishable by death. Jesus, what should we do? Trying to trap him. And Jesus answered him. He said, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. And as he did that, he knelt, knelt down and with the finger of God. And it's a wonderful study, a devotional study, just if, especially with your computer. Put the finger of God and, and just follow it through the Bible. And that finger of God was writing something in the dirt. And then it says, from the oldest to the youngest, they began to leave. Now, in my own mind, I believe that what he was writing, if this woman who was caught in the act of adultery was a prostitute, as is obviously the case, a woman well-known in the city. I think what Jesus was doing is writing down maybe some dates that those men were with this woman. And they, oh, I think I have to go now. (laughs) You know, but the idea is we've got to bear one another's burdens and Jesus bore this woman's burden. At the end, he just looked at her and he said, woman, where are thy accusers? And, And she said, I don't know. And he said, neither do I. And I do not accuse you. And then he told her to go and stop sinning. If we're unwilling to carry other people's burdens, then Jesus gives us, through the Apostle Paul, this warning, verse 3. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. When we're bearing other people's burdens, we can only do that in the love of God and the power of God. And obviously that's going to create a sense of humility. And the people that won't serve, the people that won't bear one another's burdens, I think the implication here by the placement is that those are people that think, well, well, that's just beneath me. I've got other things to do. Sometimes we who serve the Lord, we get a little carried away with ourselves. We have a tendency to think we're more important than we are. Here's something every one of you can write down, and please hear my heart on this. God doesn't need a single person in this room. God doesn't need any one of us. He doesn't need you. Now, he delights to use you. It's what he wants to do. But in order to be used by the Lord, you've got to be humble. You've got to be someone who cares about the burdens your brothers and sisters in Christ are bearing. Imagine the first century church if they didn't bear one another's burdens. An example of that from our Sunday 
Bible studies in Acts, Barnabas coming down and laying his, the money that he sold a, a valuable piece of land for at the feet of the apostles, basically saying, just, just use it, it's yours. Use it, whatever God wants you to do with it. And there were people there whose families would desert them, uh, they would disown them. And Barnabas would come along and say, here, it's a burden easer. Well, we're supposed to do that. We need to care about the people in the church of Jesus Christ and ease them. And if we're not concerned about them, often Paul is suggesting here that it's the case that we think too much of ourselves. And we're going to hear later, God's not deceived, but sometimes we are. We can get carried away with our own importance. That is not at all the position here. That's why Paul warns us, don't let somebody else's troubles make you feel superior. You know, in our church culture, we come to church, we have very large churches, there's lots and lots of people, we're on a tight schedule, there's always people coming in and going out, and what we need to do, mature Christians, to keep in step with the Spirit, what we need to do is to take time Look for people out of the way. I've begged you for years and years and years. Every time you come to church, whether it's a Wednesday, a Friday, a Sunday, or on a Monday, every time you come to church, ask God to set you up with some divine appointments. Lord, you know who's hurting. At the end of our time together tonight, as we always do on Friday, we have people up here praying. And I know there's so many people hurting, and you just sit still. These people are here to share your burdens. And they're going to approach you in love and they're going to approach you gently and they're going to approach you in humility. And all you have to do is have enough faith to come and let somebody else carry the burden. We men are the worst in the world. Oh, I got this. No, I'm fine. How you doing, bro? Oh, great. Never better. Praise the Lord. But the reality is you know better. You know that's not true. And in a situation like that one I just described, then the person who's unwilling to share is deceiving himself as well. If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Remember that you too are nothing more than a human prone to failing and falling. And when you fail and fall, God wants there to be somebody to help you get up. I had a friend, he's a pastor, he's turned his church over to somebody else now. But he told me one time, and I thought he was nuts, I really thought he was nuts. I said, so the vision of your church, what, what are some of the unique things? And here's what he said. He said, I think it's my calling to help restore pastors who've fallen into sexual sin. And he had three of them on his staff three men that failed in other churches where they were the lead pastor. And he invited them to come on his staff and then restored them. And I just thought, man, that's really taking a risk. He said, I know that's what God wants me to do. He understood this entire concept of reconciling. Remember that when we spoke about the fruit of the Spirit, love, we told, we're told, among other things, keeps no record of wrongs. But we're also told in that same passage that love is not self-seeking. And that's the idea here that Paul is communicating. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Somebody's done something, Jesus wipes it out, we need to be willing to wipe it out too. And then we need to walk with them through their difficulties and through their troubles. Pastor Juan in our church has been such a blessing for so many years. You know, one of the things I've asked Pastor Juan to do many times over the years. We have people who come in and they're alcoholics. Usually, more often, it's their drug addicts. And we'll sit and we'll tell them, look, we understand physical addiction, but once the physical addiction is out, then it's on you. Yeah, but how am I going to get rid of the physical addiction? I've had Pastor Juan sit with them overnight for days at a time just to bear their burdens. Now, that's not a thankful job. I mean, that's not something anybody would sign up for. But you see, at the end, we can tell somebody, look, now we start from scratch together. That's really what love 
does. Paul says in verse 4, each one should test his own actions. And this is in contrast to, to, to being judgmental towards somebody else or thinking yourself better than someone. And this is really important. Verse 4, each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. You might think of this as look in, not out. You know, it's so convenient for us when other people are going through difficult things, we can look at their lives and we can say things like, well, something must be wrong, they must not be right with God if they're walking in the Spirit. These kind of things wouldn't be happening to them. God is saying through the Apostle Paul, no, 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 don't look out, you look in. Now he's trying to protect you. If you want to keep in step with the Spirit, you've got to look in. I say this to you often, but whenever you're looking out at somebody else, that's the unholy Spirit. And we know who he is. The Holy Spirit is always and only going to talk to you about you. And when you start thinking that God's talking to you about other people, well, then you're being deceived. And you're setting yourself up for failure. Test your own actions. What God is doing with anybody else or through anybody else is none of our business. We need to rejoice with those who are rejoicing because they're in step with the Spirit. And we need to grieve with those who are grieving or going through difficult times because they're not in step with the Spirit. And that's why this matters so much. This one piece of counsel if taken seriously, would change the way the world views Christians as a whole. Because instead of pointing fingers and backbiting at one another, we'd be really and truly helping one another. You remember in the first century church, even those who were afraid to believe, after Ananias and Sapphira were killed, believe me, everybody was very serious before they took the step of joining the church. And they would stand back just a little bit and their comment was, boy, those Christians truly love one another. And then the Holy Spirit would use that, and of course, people kept getting saved. If people looked at us and saw that kind of love, that kind of care for other people, if the next time somebody came to you with a piece of gossip about somebody else, if you just say, look, I, I don't want to hear about any gossip, how about together we pray for that man or we pray for that woman? I got enough business looking at my own heart and checking out my own walk with Jesus Christ. And then when you do that, he says you can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. Now that's a godly pride. It's a good pride. It's, look, my heart is right, Lord, so I know what I'm doing is what you want me to do. And that's a really good feeling. It's a good feeling to walk in step with the Spirit. Poor Paula, she's such a great dancer. I'm like the worst ever. And every time we dance, and add that to my no depth perception issues, uh, it's, it's horrible for her. And you can see the look on her face. It's like, well, thank you, but, but that's pretty pitiful at the same time. <laughs> Well, Jesus will help you dance. Jesus will help you dance. And you stay in step with the Spirit. And to do that, your heart has to be right with Him. If only we would stop criticizing and judging, even gossiping about what other Christians are doing, the world would truly see the love of Christ poured out through us. Now, here's the place. Here's the thing that we got to get to. If, in fact, we're going to look into our own hearts. I'm just like you. My flesh stinks. It's no better than it was 32 years ago when I got saved. My flesh is every bit as ugly as it always was. I see things that I don't like. If I hear things that I don't agree with. If I see other people enjoying freedoms that I don't think they ought to enjoy because they're freedoms I don't have personally, I can start to judge in my mind and my heart. Now, fortunately, I don't do it with my mouth. But remember, God knows those who are his. He won't be deceived. And he knows what's true. I've learned that when my flesh begins looking out, I'm always displeasing to the Lord. Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 4, 
Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord. We'll make him able to stand. Now, if we want to, to look out at other people, then we've got to take the responsibility for making that person stand. And, of course, we can't do that. Only God can. So when somebody continues to fall, somebody continues to do things that you just don't think are the right thing to do, the only responsibility that we have is to pray for them. Now, if they're sinning, I mean, if they're outright sinning, obviously we've got to confront them. It's unloving to do so. But this is what we need to remember. God is the judge. We're not. He doesn't need our opinion on anyone else in this world. We have to be content to let each man stand or fall before God. And then he says, for each should carry his own load. As I said, you can always tell when your flesh is in control when you start complaining to God about other people. There's no prayer of repentance that we can pray for somebody else. But the way to carry your own load is to say, Jesus, you said, come unto me, all you labor, and are heavy laden. That's the load. And I will give you rest. So it's great when people can come around and help ease your burden. But you've got to learn to walk in the power of the Spirit, staying in step with the Spirit. Then you can also carry your own load. And the way you do that is by being honest with God, by repenting. Now he shifts focus in the next verses. And he talks about walking in step with the Spirit would mean you're generous. Look at verse 6. Anyone who receives instruction in the Word must share all good things with his instructor. Now make no mistake, he's talking about money here. One of the things I tell pastors when we send them out, the very most important thing a church needs new plant or otherwise, is a full-time pastor. That's the first thing, the most important thing a church needs. Somebody to tend and feed the flock. And in our culture, you know it's hard. Things are expensive. And a lot of these young pastors, they've got kids, so they're bivocational and they're working really, really hard. Here's the idea. If you've got a church with 10 people, then you ought to be able to live at the medium average income of those people. And the church needs a full-time pastor. If you're going to work, if you're staying up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, on Sunday morning getting your Sunday messages ready, you're not really doing your church any favors. And I tell people, before you think about a building, stay in your house if you've got to stay in the house, but before you get a building, before you get anything else, what you need is to be their full-time pastor. You need to be available to the people that God has entrusted with you. And the way that happens is that you share good things, material things, with the one who is sharing with you the treasure from the word of God. Good spiritual fruit produces fellowship. And that's what this word share is. It's a Greek word koinonia that we're all familiar with. It's sort of a oneness in the spirit. So how do we do it? We do it by utilizing the gifts that God has given us. And in this particular case, Paul is saying, look, if someone is sharing the word of God with you. If they're caring for your soul, I mean, that's what our job as pastors is, then make sure you share with them. Now, one of the great, great things about this is that Paul is writing this, but he never exercised that right. In fact, when he's writing to the Corinthians, he's defending himself. They're saying, well, well, well you should let us support you. And he's saying, no, no, no. And they were a carnal church and there were a lot of reasons why. But, but Paul is saying, no, 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 I'll take care of myself. And Paul would work all day as a tent maker and preach all night. He didn't take advantage of it until, by the way, we're getting there tomorrow, or not tomorrow, but Sunday, in Acts chapter 16, until he had a vision from a man from Macedonia. Come help us, the vision said. And Paul went to this really poor church in Philippi. People got saved. And suddenly they got really generous. Now when I said they were really poor, that's how they started. 
but because they were generous, because they were walking in step with the Spirit, then God was able to bless them. And Paul said over and over, you gave abundantly above your ability to give, and God just kept blessing you. And it's all because they wanted to share. And it was that detour to Philippi that enabled Paul to stop the tent making and be fully supported for the rest of his ministry in the second missionary journey and on into the third missionary journey. Now here's the key. How we view material things, Paul says, is a reflection of our view of spiritual things. If you're stingy with your material things, you're not walking in step with the Spirit because then we're being stingy with that which really belongs to God. And Paul understood the principle. He didn't take advantage of it. But now he's saying, writing to the churches in Galatia, he's saying, share. This is a good trade. You're the one who's being blessed. You're the ones who are benefiting. That's the principle of this whole thing. Now let me make another point. We're going to see that if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap from the Spirit. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap from the Spirit. We all know that spiritual principle. Now here's what humans have done to this whole concept of being generous. We've said, well look, if you give to God, God will give you more. Now that's true. It's a spiritual principle you can't deny. But if your motive for giving to God is so that he'll give you more, then he can't give you anything because your motive is selfish. It's directed inward and it isn't out of the generosity of your heart. We tell you God loves a cheerful giver. It just thrills him to give when people are generous. Paula was reading to me today, Proverbs chapter 11. Every time she gets there, she, she reminds me, a generous man will himself be blessed by God. One translation says, another one says, will prosper. But, but we don't prosper because we are generous so that God will do something for us. There's no reward for that kind of giving. If you're giving because you want something back, it's better not to give at all. That's coming from a pastor of a church that needs a lot of money. But understand, God wants you to give because you're generous. If you're walking in step with the Spirit, you're going to be generous. Generous with other people. Generous with your time. Generous with your talent. So all of that is important. And then he says this, and, and usually when it gets to money, that's sort of the dividing line, you know, that shows us where our heart really is. So that's why Paul says in verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Now let me give you previews for next week. I think I'm going to do an entire study on just this one verse. I think that's what the Lord is leading, but I'll let you know when you get here next Friday night. But the, the idea here is we think we can fool God. We think we can live our way. We can approach God on our terms. We think that if we're nice people and if we're coming to church, if we're doing our part, if we're giving a little bit in the offering box or if we're serving once in a while whenever it's convenient, we actually think we're doing something and God is in heaven and why you can fool me and why you can fool other people, we can't fool God at all. And what we've got to understand is that God is the one who wants only the best for us. Why it is that we think we can fool God? Now, God doesn't smite us when we do bad stuff or when we're selfish. But he knows. The Father emptied the bank of heaven for your soul and mine. The parable of the pearl of great price indicates he would have done it if it was only for one person. He emptied the bank of heaven for you. Should we not be generous men and women and we can think we're doing fine but God knows what you're holding back God knows whether you're really walking by faith and by that I mean you're trusting him and yet we so often 
approach God like he doesn't know these things. And then he says, we'll reap what we sow. So bountifully we'll reap bountifully, so sparingly. And we'll reap sparingly. You know, we can think that we're doing God a favor by coming to church. We think we can do God, or we might think we're doing God a favor by, by, by giving. But the reality is God wants to know where your heart is. Do you really believe that everything you have belongs to him? If not, take the counsel from verse 4 and check your own hearts. What would give you any right to believe that anything that you have belongs to you? When God gave everything for you, when God saved you, reconciled with you while we were enemies of God, what would make you think that anything you have belongs to you? What would make you think when you get up in the morning that even your time is your own? Now, God's going to give you plenty of time to do your stuff. But you see, this all begins with a heart that says, Jesus, everything I am, everything that I have, everything that I ever will be, everything that I ever will get comes from you, and it's all yours, Barnabas and Acts. He laid it all down at the feet of the apostles. Why? Because he was walking in step with the Spirit. How generous has Jesus been in your life? Now, this isn't me pleading with you for money. I just want you to think, to consider carefully how generous Jesus has been with you. And then check your own heart about your own level of generosity. Are you generous in spirit? By that I mean, are you willing to keep no record of wrongs? Are you willing, love always trusts, willing to believe the best about people? Are you willing to bear one another's burdens? You see, if Jesus says walk and step with the Spirit, those are the things that measure our level of generosity. Are you concerned about you more than you're concerned about other people? You can't bear somebody else's burdens if you're holding your own. So the idea here is being generous of Spirit and God knows what's true about our hearts. The same principle works with spiritual matters. Verse 8 says, the one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. And I think a lot of us know enough about that to validate the veracity of that statement. But here's the key. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. You know, we can sometimes do spiritual things for carnal reasons. And God is always going to make sure it doesn't work that way. Well, I'm, I'm doing a good thing. Well, it doesn't matter. You know, it's uh, funny. I mean, we, we're grateful, but at the end of the year, that's when most of our giving comes in, especially the last 10 days of December every year. People want tax breaks and things like that. And I get that, and you should take advantage of the tax breaks. But the idea is people give at the end. And God says, look, I just want to know your heart. Why are you doing it? Why would you withhold all year and then give at the end? And we'll have people, well, I just want to do something good. Invariably, people will come and say, you know, I want to buy turkeys for all the single moms. Well, that's a good thing. But why do you want to do it? Is it a guilt offering? Or is it something God's really put on your heart? Now, I don't need to know, but you do, and you need to know because God knows. And what we want to reap is the richness, the fullness of eternal life, and we do that with the Lord because we know we can't fool Him. Those of us who live, invest in, sow in the bad fruit of the sinful nature, well, we're going to reap destruction those of us who sow to the Spirit. We're going to reap the things of the Spirit, and that's the abundant life that Jesus promised. And finally, he says this. Let us not become weary. I'm going to stop there for a moment, because by weary, it's not just being tired, 
you know, worry because there's constant pressure of things. The burdens that we're carrying get too big for us to bear. We grow weary because of discouragement. The enemy is always trying to pour discouragement, even depression on people. And that's why he says, let us not become weary in well-doing. I like that better than in doing good. It's like well-doing. It's just this constant flow from our lives in the Spirit. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, as we have opportunity, God's not even asking you to go out of your way. He's just saying, be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. There's a whole bunch of Christians that want us to solve all the problems in the world. You Christians, you have all these big buildings and these, these expensive things and you pay people these expensive salaries and, and they're not talking about us, obviously. But the idea here is they think, no, why don't we just give all the money to the poor? Well, that doesn't make any sense. This is not grow weary of well-doing in the body of Christ, as you'll see in a moment. That's our first concern. This is family. Moms and dads, you take care of your own sons and daughters long before you take care of somebody else's kids. Why? It's because it's family. And in the church family, don't grow weary of well-doing. Now, the reasons people grow weary is simple. You know, we're, we're working in the flesh rather than in the spirit. Now, physically, we get tired. That's okay. Paul says that I'm spent. In other words, I got nothing left. But then he says, but I'm willing to be spent. That needs to be our approach. Pastor Ron, Sunday's my only day off. Well, the problem is it's not your day. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't stop serving because you're not getting the response that you think you should get. This is the beauty of walking in step with the Spirit. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. You know, we can't solve the homeless problem. We want to be nice, we want to be kind, we want to demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit. But here's something that we all can do something about. There are people in this body who are hurting. Now, as a church, we're really generous for people in need. And we want to know about those problems, those issues. But something as simple as inviting somebody to lunch after church. You never know where that might be the one full meal they get. Getting to know somebody getting some insight, spiritual insight to the burdens they're carrying and the difficulty of their lives. I can promise you single moms especially, but some single dads as well, they're in need. And this is a family of believers. That doesn't mean that we loan people money. It doesn't mean that as Christians we're to be easy touches for the people that come in, and unfortunately it's true, people do come in and try to take advantage of people like us because we are easy touches. But here's the thing. When somebody says there's a need, tell me to meet them at church. How about we go to lunch and talk about it? It's not just giving stuff away. It's carrying their burdens. You see, when you walk in step with the Spirit, that's the kind of generosity that comes from walking with Jesus. Again, a lot of us get tired, but persevering through it is the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul and I, we have a saying, you know, especially Sunday, because my brain is mush after three services on Sunday. And she'll say, how you doing? And I'll say, I'm tired. And then together we'll say, but it's a good tired. That's what it is to walk in the Spirit. And we wake up the next day invigorated, refreshed, and ready to do it all over again. That's the blessing, the benefit 
of walking in step with the Spirit. Do good to everyone. Don't judge anyone. Point out sin when necessary. But do good to everyone, unbelievers and believers alike. But begin with the family of God. Be a blessing to anyone and everyone who seems to be carrying a bit of a burden. And just see how refreshing it really is.